It is a huge, huge treat for you guys today. I'm podcast interviewing a legend oral surgeon, Dr. Oli T. Jensen. And I don't know, you, you guys have, I don't know if you've heard of uh, Clear Choice or not. Um, they are, it's a dental implant center. And um, I, I love Clear Choice because I'm in Phoenix, Arizona. They have a center. And you're always doing infomercials on uh, implants. Mm -hmm which is driving many patients to clear choice to get implant surgeries. But I have to tell you, it's driving a ton of patients to my office where my patients for 25 years saying, uh, yeah, Dr. Fran, I watch this infomercial for clear choice. And, and the next thing you know, you're doing a big implant. So I, I imagine every time clear choice does a dollar, the local dental community probably does. I, I, it'd have to be at least five or 10 because I'm only one dentist out of, 3,800 in this metro, and I can't even imagine how many patients uh, you've driven to my office with your infomercials, but I'm gonna read your bio, because uh, you really, truly are a legend. Uh, Dr. Jensen received his bachelor's degree from the University of Utah. He completed his DDS degree at the Northwestern University School of Dentistry and his anesthesiology residency at Northwestern University of Medicine. He completed his oral and maxillofacial surgery resident at the University of Michigan. Dr. Jensen is a diplomat of the American Board of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery, that's amazing, and a fellow of the American Dental Society of Anesthesiology. He is interested in bone grafting, dental implants, and distraction osteogenesis. He is currently clinical assistant professor at New York University, University of Michigan, and University of Colorado, Denver. Dr. Jensen has held a variety of teaching positions since the early 1980s and also served as a clinical instructor in the St. Joseph General Practice Residency Program. Dr. Jensen has been a guest lecturer at scores of seminars and symposium with a strong focus on implant dentistry, bone grafting, and maxillofacial surgery throughout North America, as well as in Europe and Japan. Dr. Jensen holds hospital appointments at six major facilities in the Denver area. Um, he has, uh, I'm sure he's gloating right now about the Super Bowl. We'll try to, if you're a Carolina Panther fan, uh, he won't gloat too long. He has been involved in numerous independent research projects, is the author of three textbooks on oral surgery, more than two dozen scientific papers and publications, and has been part of implant-related clinical research studies. Oli, I can't believe you're sitting in my house, dude. It is beyond... It's a pleasure, Howard. It is, uh, it is just a huge honor. So, um... So clear choice, um, clear choice started in 2006. It's been a decade, 2016. Um, it was started by, uh, Dr. Don Maloney, a general dentist, right. uh, Steve Boyd, an MBA, and then yourself. And when I talked to Don, he says that, um, you were the, the genius behind the, um, the actual implant protocol. Uh, how, how's that been going for you? Well, the thing about, uh, clear choice, uh, when I came on board, they had already been working. Uh, they had um, a very fine prosthodontist, Dr. Mark Adams. They had an oral surgeon there, but they were thinking about altering the business plan and doing non-specialty dentists to do the care. And uh, at the same time, they were trying to get me to be their primary oral surgeon. Well, I told them I wouldn't come on board unless it was a specialty care situation because this is these are complicated cases that I thought required a, a prosthodontist and an oral maxillofacial surgeon. A lot of these people are very, very sick. We put them to sleep for surgery. It's not the kind of thing that, um, you know, it's the kind of thing that requires anesthesia training so and medical management. So I thought, you know, if we're going to do this as a business, why not do this very, very first class? Have the best doctors, the best business processes, the best, uh, uh, you know, marketing processes, and really, really do something outstanding. And that's what the, uh, what the group did together. It wasn't one person that, that solved this, but uh, many, many people. As a matter of fact, the, um, the present CEO, Kevin Mosier, he was at the open house of our very first office So he, in 2006. So we're, uh, we've, we've had some longevity and some good consistency and some good interaction throughout the, from the very beginning. And it, it's, um, 
it's it's a high cost implant center too. I mean, you're not you're not known as the Southwest Airlines, Costco, Sam's Club, IKEA of implants. I mean, no, their no, choice is not, pricey. It's not an inexpensive thing. However, I would say that our cost basis for patients is probably somewhat less, maybe twenty percent less, just because we have efficiency in the system. What what do, do you have a standard bread and butter case? I mean, is your average patient coming in with full dentures, getting to implant retained removable dentures, or what, what would you say is your 80, 20, what, what's 80% of your business? Well, it doesn't work out that way, but about half of the business is a dentalist treatment. So patients who have lost their teeth or are soon to lose their teeth, um, they don't have a very good solution with going to dentures. As a matter of fact, there's a great fear among patients when they're just ready to lose their teeth. Maybe they have several teeth left and now they have to lose them. Uh, they don't want to go to dentures. They want to have uh, you know, solid appliances that they can chew with. And those are, that's our bread and butter, the, uh, the edentulous patient. Uh, more, about half, maybe a little bit more than half our patients are those, those categories. So, so you're saying half are edentulous and, and need improvement right and the other half are just about at a dentulous no the the other half are they could be a uh you know a partially dentulous they might be a, a single missing tooth or may, maybe three or four missing teeth so it's just a standard dental implant practice where you're maybe replacing one or two teeth with implants you know there you know one neat thing about being a dentist for 30 years is you got to see which predictions came true and which ones didn't true mm -hmm. I remember when we were learning removable dentures at University of Missouri, Kansas City in the 80s, the dentures were coming to an end. It was, it was going to go extinct. And yet now you look at the data and, and um, removable dentures is still growing strong 30 years later. Right, right. The dentures are not going to go away. And the, C we... the CDC says 10% of Americans at 65 are edentulous mm -hmm. and 20% at 75. Is that what you're hearing? Yeah, there's a lot of uh, a lot of people that are near edentulous. You know, maybe maybe even fifteen percent of the population. Then you have the edentulous population, which is you know up to twenty percent or more. One one of the things I always keep wondering is if if you're um you know you're not born with P. gingivalis, and until a tooth erupts through, you can't catch it from your mom because there's no place for it to grow. When you start with a fully edentulous person and there's really no place for P. gingivalis to be living except maybe your tonsils or something, do you have a lot less periimplantitis if you're starting with a full denture patient as opposed to the other half who are on their final stages of you teeth? can You can, if you have peri, periodontitis in the mouth and you put implants adjacent, those bacteria will hop onto the implants. And so you can get peri-implantitis, so to speak, in a patient who has uncontrolled uh, periodontitis. So in the setting of a, an edentulous patient, they don't have that reservoir there. So they're starting kind of with a clean bill of health. If they take care of their teeth, they're not going to have a, a recurrence of their periodontitis with, now that they've got implants. So, so do you have higher i mean do you measure higher implant success rates starting with a fully dentulous patient than someone who's got teeth not necessarily um, not necessarily i think that you do have a higher incidence of infection around teeth when you have adjacent teeth that are infected i will tell you that our uh, results with uh, dentulous treatment with implants we see an uh, implant loss of maybe two to three to four percent over a five-year span. So we don't see a lot. Uh, we do see some peri-implantitis, but that incidence is also very low, a few percent. So interestingly, with dental implants, you have, in a way, a little bit more resistance to periodontitis-type inflammation uh, than with teeth. So implants are, are uh, excellent and as long as they're osteointegrated to prevent uh, this kind of an infection occurring.
so you have 30 centers you you you're born you're from colorado i know you're in arizona you're from utah are they mostly 30 in the southwest or have you crossed the no, mississippi we have river them all, all across the country and we're planning on growing more so we have them in florida and california and, and uh you know uh we're going to go into the northeast and midwest we have we have four centers around chicago for example and, and for the 50 percent that are edentulous um is it what do you know any set stats about these patients i mean like what would the average age be are they more likely to be the women ad, than men they are a little bit more likely to be um well let's put it this way the women tend to come in and have seek treatment more frequently than the men maybe about four or five percent more just uh, four or five yes just 55 to 45 mm -hmm. because now the the men are starting to take care of themselves or they have wives or whatever and they're starting to take care of themselves so Almost half our patients are men, but there's still a little bit more, more, more women. And uh, the average age is, um, I would say, 55 to 60. 55. We, do, we do see patients in, 80, in their 80s, and we do see some patients even in their 30s, you know, that are losing their teeth sometimes. And, and what does the average patient at um, Clear Choice with a full denture get? I mean, are, are they doing two two implants and balls four and a hater bar or is it all implant supported fixed is it implant supported removal what what is your your you main know, when i when i came on board i had an experience being doing implants for many many years and we had done a lot of cases with two implants and a removable and i really like that approach and i liked it because it was not cost prohibitive but there was a lot of maintenance. Uh, the, the, let's, for example, if you had a bar and a clip or anchors that would you know, have to be changed a lot. And uh, so we, we saw problems over time with the overdenture approach, even though I liked it from an access standpoint for patients. So given that, uh, as, a, as, a, uh, as a strategy to really help people, and give them something that would last and not have require a lot of repairs, we decided to avoid doing the overdenture approach and go straight to a fixed approach. That did double about the cost basis, but it, it increased the success overall. You know, in, in an overdenture setting, those patients tend to lose those implants and they tend to get peri-implantitis around them much more frequently than in a fixed setting. So it's healthier to go in a fixed setting. So we made a decision to just do that. So in clear choice, we do not do overdentures at all. And what, what is your, what is, if, what is the average person who comes in with a full denture get? What is the average treatment plan? Well, your they, most typical they, treatment plan. commonly we do what's called an all on four. But sometimes we would get, do more implants than four. But biomechanically, we have found that four implants is all that's required if you have adequate anterior-posterior spread, spread. Now, I understand that most of the people that are listening would be dentists, so let me just get a little technical. Anterior-posterior spread is the key biomechanical factor for stability of a fixed appliance. It's more important than the number of implants. That's really hard to kind of understand because we as dentists, we think more is better. We want to have six or eight implants. But what we found out is that the distribution with, with the implants front to back is actually the most important biomechanically. I'll give you just a um, a little discussion that I had with uh, John Brunsky, who is a Stanford biomechanist and probably the foremost biomechanical lecturer in dental implantology today. Can you, can you score me a podcast with him? Uh, I doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know. You could ask him. He's a very, very cool guy. But I really pinned him down because I was very um, disturbed by this concept of number and the dentists in the dental field, probably almost all the dentists in your, in your group here with Dental Town, think about 
um, dental implants as an analog to teeth. So you think about a dental implant as similar to a tooth in terms of you know crown and bridge uh, biomechanical restoration that you shouldn't quite do that. So what I found out when talking with Dr. Brunsky is he took a biomechanical mathematics, a mathematical model. This is based on the Scalac model that Brandemark uh, came up with. And on a curve, like an, on an arch, they put six implants in and they mathematically figured out where the forces were and so on. And then he put four implants in and then he put three implants in. So, and he checked the different biomechanical aspects. <clears throat> if the AP spread, <clears throat> excuse me, if the anterior posterior spread were the same. So if you only had four implants or you only had three implants, but they were spread adequately, guess what? They had similar biomechanical capacity. So three, four, five, six were very, very close. So why use eight? Why use six? Why use five? Why use four? And now there's even a debate, especially in the mandible, why use four when, when you can use three? So this is for fixed full arch appliance, the biomechanical uh, requirement. So having that knowledge, uh, clear choice, analyze this and also with uh, input from Bo Rangert, the biomechanist for Nobel Pharma, and also with Paula Malo, the uh, oral surgeon who really helped popularize the all in four. And uh, he's Steve. out of Spain. <clears throat> yes, I he was out of Lisbon, Portugal. Lisbon, Portugal. And then also uh, Dr. Mark Adams, Dr. Steve Perro, Dr. Steve Eckert, many, many prominent uh, doctors in the field. We made a decision that four implants is adequate and that that would be a good strategy for us to use at Clear Choice. And so we did that in, uh, and since, 19, and since 2006. And like I said, we've had the results over that period of time of only a few percent failure rate in both arches using that, that limited number of implants. So we believe that, um, that this, is, this is adequate. Uh, just to give you some numbers, you know, we in Denver probably do three to 400 arches per year, just, just in Denver. And you know, if you have a, have a business that is related to dental implants, you're not going to do stuff that are going to put the business at risk. So this has a business, a, a scientific, and a clinical uh, basis uh, of, uh, of validity. And so we, we stand by the way we treat our, our uh, edentulous patients with this, with this method. So when you're talking about biomechanical forces, you're talking about the, the AP spread is very right. important. Right. But are you also angling the implants and, uh, and that is a game changer too? Well, the, the angling of the implants is such an interesting thing um, because that is saying the same thing. By, by angling the implants, you increase the anterior-posterior spread. So it's like a table. You're having the table legs on the, on the corners instead of, you know, like in the middle of the table where it can wobble. So angling an implant allows us to get our implant access close in the maxilla to the first molar. That's the posterior implant. I mean, that's pretty impressive. And then the anterior implant would be approximately in the canine, maybe a little bit forward of that in the canine lateral location. So these implants are about 20 millimeters apart, 20, 20, 20. That's a very, very solid foundation as long as the implants are individually in bone and, and, and solid. And in the mandible, angulation of the implant was very important to avoid the inferior alveolar nerve. Very important. And I would say that that's one of the biggest advances in dentistry in the last 15 years is to be able to angle an implant away from the nerve for safety and yet get increased anterior posterior spread for your mandibular uh, prostheses. So where are you angling the implant on the posterior mandible to avoid well, the... Well, the, the implant, you know, the nerve comes out between the 
uh, first buy and second buy location. So I'm going to go ahead and place the implant at a 30 degree angle in about the first bicuspid region and it's going to angle and emerge back behind the nerve maybe maybe four or five millimeters so that it's in the second by even the the anterior part of the first molar location and avoid the nerve at a 30 degree angle another thing that's important and you you see this in your trigonometry by by angling an, a, a body 30 degrees you increase its length 50 percent so when you put an imp if there's 10 millimeters of bone available and you put it in straight up and down, you have a 10 millimeter length in implant possible. But if you put it at 30 degrees, you can put a 15 millimeter length implant. These things are sometimes important to gain fixation and strength to the implant. Now that's so truly amazing. Now you started out originally only with noble biocare implants. Right, right. And you changed that recently? Yes, we did. Um, you know, the we have to give tremendous credit to Nobel, what a what an organization, what a tremendous company, and and the the research teams, the the technology. I I mean it's it's fantastic what they have done. Um, we had made an effort to, um, you know, in business sometimes you have to negotiate, right? You have to say, hey, you know, we're doing so many implants, can we have a break? And uh, the negotiations just didn't, you know, didn't work out favorably for Nobel. And Strawman came in and made a, a pitch, and uh, we made a decision to go that direction, but strictly on from a business standpoint. And what what implant system did you and go now with? Now we use the uh, Strawman implant. I it, now is that Strawman or ITI? Yeah, Strawman? it is. It, it is the ITI implant. They have Switzerland. Uh, yes, it's a Swiss implant. They also have an implant uh, company that they have acquired that has the same surface treatment as they have, and it's called Neodent. So the Neodent implant is basically the, the, the new Strauman implant. Then they have a bone level implant, and they have a tissue level implant. And now they have coming on board a new zygomatic implant. So the Strauman company has sort of caught up with the Nobel company. And so we just made a business decision. Uh, the clinical um, appraisal between the two is not significantly different. So you went from Noble BioCare in Sweden to ITI Strauma in Switzerland. Was the well, both of them are in, in Switzerland now. Oh, both are in yeah, Switzerland now? Nobel is in Switzerland, and next door to them is Strauma. They're both in Switzerland. Now, now um, there's 175 implant companies. Mm -hmm. um, could a, could any of them work for you, or are there or well, are there some criteria where I'm a I'm a private practitioner. I work with with uh, uh, Clear Choice, of course, but I ha have a private practice as well. And in that private practice, I have all kinds of doctors that work with all kinds of different implants. So I probably have worked with maybe 10 or 15 different implants, and I currently work with maybe five or six different implants besides Nobel and Strauman. For example, I have done uh, all in four on a Zimmer implant type of implant. I've done it on a BioHorizons type of implant. I'm doing one with an Intralock, um, Cortex, an Israeli company. Um, there's uh, just Astra, there's all these different uh, capabilities now with the different companies. So you can't say that by brand, um, this operation of the all in four is, is exclusionary. You can't say that anymore. What, um, what else has got you excited in? Oh, well, I, I want to first ask you a business question because you guys were founded by uh, Don Maloney, who's a general dentist, um, Steve Bonnet, MBA. Um, let's, let's move passion off the table. You know, I always tell my homies that I want them to be happy and healthy. And like, well, like when they ask me if I should, if they should go into specialty school, I say, well, first, does something excite you? And if they say, yeah, I really want to do that. I, I always say, follow your dreams and be happy and healthy. But some dentists, when it comes to implants, um, they they might be scared and they're looking at, 
should I go learn how to place implants and invest in all this courses, time training? And then I'm, I sometimes say, well, look at, look at clear choice because those, when you set up a clear choice center, like in Phoenix, you don't have employee um, surgeons that work there Monday, Friday, five, don't you bring in contract independent contractors no, to come they, in? As a matter of fact, the, the doctors in Phoenix are both fully employed there. So they're employees. Yeah, they're f fully employed there. Let me talk a little bit about this question about should dentists do implants? Yes. Should general dentists? Yes, 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 yes. Now I understand that more than 60% of implants done in the United States are done by general dentists. Is that right? Mm -hmm. 60, true. okay, I, I'm gonna home in on that. 60% general of, dentists. Of implants that are ordered by you know, two companies are by general practitioners. And of, so of the, um, of the number of general dentists, what percent of the general dentists are placing those 60%? Well, that, that is a very good question because some of the dentists don't do it with a lot of frequency. Like maybe they might do two implants a year. Some might do 20, some might do more. Uh, so the, the data on that is pretty, um, pretty, um, in, indeterminate. I would say that a third of dentists now are getting involved in, dentist, in, in implant dentistry as surgical placers of implants. But probably two thirds of dentists are doing implant dentistry where they're the restorative dentists. And in the major metropolitan areas, the, these percentages go a little bit higher. So implant dentistry is, is big. But let me tell you one thing that that we detected at Clear Choice, and which I've seen in my private practice as well, is that we, we want patients to have optimal treatment. All of us do as, as doctors. We, we want our patients to have the best treatment. We, if we're a, a general dentist, we know that there are certain things that you know we shouldn't do, and we, and we refer those out. But then there's other things that we think we're capable of doing, and, and you should do those. So we have a program, for example, with all on four treatment, where any general dentist can contact a clear choice center and they can have the surgeon there do the implant placement and management and so on. And the dentist can kind of come in as a guest and do the rest of the treatment and charge for it. So we, and we teach them. So how long have you been doing this? We've been doing that for a number of years. I, I wasn't aware of it. Yeah. Yeah. We do that. And so I have a number of dentists and, and even prosthodontists in the area of, of Denver. So they, so they, they can, come in, they, they come can in. bring you a patient. Mm -hmm. Your or are they all oral surgeons or some of them periodontist? Well, I've had, these are, they're usually general dentists. Or no, no, no. I mean the, the clear choice doctors. Oh, the clear choice doctors are all prosthodontists and oral surgeons. They're all oral surgeons and prosthodontists. Mm -hmm. So ex explain the details. I bring, a, I bring my mom to you. Right. That's kind of a perfect example. You know, sometimes you don't, you want your mom to have, you know, specialty care, but maybe you want to do her denture or her denture prosthesis for her. So you would come in, introduce the patient. We'd set up the surgery. The lab at Clear Choice does the prosthetics and the, and the pickup impressions and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But you go ahead and after the surgery is done, you go ahead and, and place the prosthesis. You screw in the prosthesis, the provisional, the interim prosthesis. And then you take your patient, your mom, whoever, home and follow them. And then at, at the time when you want to go forward with the final prosthesis, then you can take impressions and complete the final case. So that clear choice is just sort of assisting you in the overall care of your patient. So all 30 clear choice centers have their own in-office lab? Mm -hmm. And they will help patients, not just for all on four, but any kind of case. And there are some very, very complicated bone graft failure cases or you know, management cases. We, we enjoy helping doctors treat their, their patients. We understand that there's a competitive distance between uh, a... Um, a corporate entity and private practitioners. We're trying to break that down and trying to be open. And hopefully, uh, you know, with this, with this uh, podcast, maybe that will break down some of the barriers 
and just give these doctors a call and just say, hey, listen, I would like to try, you know, to do an all on four on this special patient of mine. Could I work with you? And, I, and they're going to say yes. Well, I would say that all recorded human history, people do not like competition or transparency. <laughs> they always want a monopoly. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. You know, I think to bring that wall down completely um, would be if um, you or your team um, got on Dentaltown Online CE mm -hmm. and did a clear choice. Um, you, you know, right now on the internet, there is no, 2016, there's no A to Z, 10, 20, 30 hour curriculum on how to do implantology from diagnosing a tree implant to do it. Right. It's all bits and pieces. Like right. this guy does an hour, this guy does a 20 minute YouTube. Mm -hmm. If, if you put um, an online CE course and 210,000 dentists had access to it on Dental Town and 40,000 of them had access to it on their iPhone and explained all this, I, I think it'd be a huge business yeah, that, opportunity that, that's for very, That's clear a very care. interesting thing. I will tell you that, you know, if you get five dentists in the room and you're talking about any kind of restorative procedure, you might get five opinions, right? <laughs> Absolutely. And so in implant dentistry, um, there's controversy on what to do, how, how things should be done. At the Academy of Bossier Integration, we, we still over and over again are talking about single tooth implants in the anterior zone in an argumentative way. It's not fully solved. There are still different techniques, different styles, different approaches uh, being made. And so there, there is not yet this ABC uh, approach where we can really say, hey, this is, this is a defined evidence-based uh, treatment. We're still in the, in the realm of kind of expert opinion, and this is the way I do it, and this is my success criteria. Uh, but th those kind of things are still valuable for dentists. Well, it's it's kind of a, a sign of intelligence. I mean, when you're not really intelligent, everything is binomial, black, white, yes, mm -hmm. no, up, down. And as you get smarter and older and wiser, um, like, like there's people who don't believe in bridges. I mean, I can't tell you how many beautiful women, high lip lines that I can predictably nail with a three unit bridge to replace one missing tooth. Mm -hmm. And they'll just think that that's just yeah. somehow evil. Mm -hmm because they want to save enamel because they're a dentist. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to destroy bone by right. placing the implant. Um, in fact, yeah, I want to... Want... That, that, that we've gone way overboard on one way. We did go way overboard on the other way. I mean, there we probably need to walk back. It's not illegal, unethical to do a three-tooth bridge. There are some patients it's indicated for. However... The single tooth implant where you have virgin teeth on each side, I will tell you that that's always been something that we've treatment planned in my practice and also at Clear Choice as a single tooth implant. Restoration is being the most optimal, least, most conservative and least uh, invasive uh, technique. And the highest degree of technical, uh, because if she's, if she's a beautiful woman with mm -hmm. a high lip line and when she shows gum when she smiles mm -hmm. and it's a central incisor, She's going to hold you to the highest. I mean, you, you have to nail it. Let me tell, tell you something about the, what the dentist could do. You know, don't, don't do the anterior maxillary teeth. Just don't single teeth for implants. Don't, don't do that. The periodontist, the oral surgeon, we have a hard time doing those cases. And they're not um, economically uh, positive. <laughs> a lot of times <laughs> so just just don't do them you know but there are cases you can do what's the most common tooth loss do you remember first molar right and what's the most common implant done first molar first molar so is there a lot of risk for you from an aesthetic standpoint for you as a dentist to do those molars no so if you're going to get started out do those molars by cuspids and guess what? That's going to be a huge addition to your practice. Just limiting yourself to that. You don't need to do these big. Additions. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hold, I'm gonna put you, uh, your seat on the fire right now because you're you're talking to uh, thousands uh, of dentists and podcast consumers. Is this where the real truth comes out? This is the real truth. <laughs> what, what what if she's driving to work right now and she's 30 years old and she got out of dental school three years ago and she's never placed in blank? Can she go to a Clear Choice Center and yes. just watch them? Yes. 
Mm-hmm. And, and see, I'm always saying street smart people. I'm always saying find someone in your backyard, but they the always feel like fact, they got to fly let's across say the, the country. Let's say they practice in uh, Alabama. She could call me on the phone. She could fly to Denver, and she could watch surgery if she wanted to. All day. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And what what main states but are you in? Of course, she would want to be probably develop a relationship closer to where she practices. But I'm just telling you, I'm personally open to that. My our practice in Denver is personally open to that. There's a practice in Atlanta. I know they're personally open to that. Fort Lauderdale, San Diego. Portland, I know, and and they always complain they got four hundred thousand dollars student loans, and when they want to learn something, they always pick a four thousand dollar course on the other side of the country and stay at a five star mm-hmm. resort to learn like two things on occlusion. I'm right. and I'm always saying, why didn't you just walk across the street to the medical dental building across the street from you and knock on their door? But I think when someone's saying, oh give me money they feel like okay i'll give you money that's permission to go Mm -hmm. and they just don't they just feel guilty maybe that well why would you let me why this is what they're going to say this is exactly what they say they say well why would Oli teach me how to place an implant when he his business is placing implants he doesn't want to teach a competitor so it just it's totally counterintuitive there there is there is some level where maybe it it's not um um it's not mutually beneficial, you know, maybe there is some level, but that is not what happens in my experience. Right. Someone that's really trying to come in and undercut me or something, they, they don't come in, you know, they don't have the clarity of conscience to do that. It's the same. But people that call up and say, hey, listen, um, I hear you do uh, these small implants for the lower anterior mandible, you know, for, for these single teeth in the, in the lower incisors. I've never seen that. It's okay if I come in and see. I've got a patient that needs one of these. Absolutely. You know? Because how can we get experience? I do more than 2,000 implants a year. I have a lot of opportunities to experience things. But if a dentist is doing 20 implants a year, how much opportunity does he have to get experience or she have get experience? You know? So you have to, you have to collaborate. So back back to the first molars. Um, she's never done one. I'm, I'm talking to the two thirds have never done one. Um, would which is uh, which is actually um, a better first candidate, maxillary or mandible first molar? What, what, what do you think well, would be the lowest hanging fruit? The easiest one to do, but the um, <laughs> you would ask about a maxillary first molar. That is a little trickier because sometimes the sinus does dip down quite a way. And if that happens, just stay away from that. Don't do that one. Just, you know, go forward. And sometimes in the manual, the nerve is quite high. There's only six millimeters. Well, stay away from that. But a lot of times, it's not that, that way. There's, there's plenty of room to put a, a 10 millimeter length implant. And you want to put a wider one for the mandible, you know, for a molar. So, for example, in the Strawman, they have a, a 4.8 wide neck implant. And in the man, in the Nobel, they have a six millimeter wide uh, implant, and you know the Zimmer, they have a wide body type implant. There's a company called uh, Southern Implants. They have a very nice implant that's even up to nine millimeters in width. It can be used during extraction sites. So look at the different products out there, and you can make a decision on what what you what you like to do. I I just want to rattle off a few of the most commonly asked questions, and I know I asked uh, I've asked okay. these before, but cement or screw on a single? That is such a good question. <laughs> You're the first guest that ever said you that. You are smart, man. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to give you guys a heads up. The answer to that question is neither. So how can you get an implant fastened to a crown without a screw and without cement? The reason you don't want to use cement is because you almost always get leakage. So if you can cement it outside the mouth and then screw it in, that's one way that people have done things. It's just kind of crazy. But if you get cement around your... your uh, subgingival area, you're going to be prone for peri-implantitis. So you don't want to cement. 
And that's what the dentists want to do. And that's what most of them do. But that's what I don't recommend. And then the second uh, idea is, well, use screw retention. Well, screw retention sounds pretty easy, but people in the, in the general dental offices, they don't, maybe in the prosthodontist office they like it, but in the general dental office they don't. It's little tiny screws, they're a nice thing to, to get suctioned up in the suction and swallowed and lost, and, and it's just not your game to be working with those little screws. So a lot of people avoid those things. So, and then the screws can get loose, bent, and the restorations rattle. So how can you attach a crown to an implant? In about three or four months, we're gonna have a new technology approved. And it comes out of San Francisco, it's a startup. Uh, the company's called Roto Medical. Uh, they've been studied out at UCLA and they have publications already and I've done some of the um, cases for them so I happen to know about them and we intend to use them at Clear Choice. And what it is is a, it's nitinol is the metal that is the connector between the crown and the implant. Nitinol is what orthodontics use to do their arch wire because it's a memory metal, and that's what the cardiologists use when they do their stents. So these things are, it's very biocompatible. Uh, and what memory metal does is it, you put it in, it's kind of like a sleeve on top of the abutment. You put the crown in, and then you just activate it with a little uh, electric wand that kind of heats it up a little bit, and it, and it expands, changes shape, and then the crown can't come off. And it's very, very powerfully strong. It doesn't ever come off. And then later on, let's say the porcelain breaks on the crown a couple of years later, you can cool that metal with a special instrument, and then it contracts. You can take the crown off, repair it, put it back on. And so this is the future of implant dentistry, is to use this rotomedical device, this nitinol sleeve, for fixing not only single teeth, but also multiple teeth, like all on four. That is so exciting. And they heard it first on the Dentistry Uncensored podcast. And you can look it up on their website, Roto Medical. The, uh, the, the mechanical engineer, his name's Young So, S-E-O, wonderful man. S-E-O is his last name? Uh-huh. And his and first he, name, Young, yeah. Y-U-N-G? Yeah, Y-O-U-N-G. Y-O-U-N-G. Uh-huh. And he came out of the University of Michigan, where I came, and he was a mechanical engineer. He's a genius. And, um, and then Benjamin Wu is the uh, also a mechanical engineer, a prosthodontist that also works there, formerly at UCLA. Um, so you can, if you want to call out there and talk to a dentist, you can talk to Dr. Wu, or if you want to talk to Dr. Or, or Young So, uh, you can learn about the product. And that's something that's going to be coming uh, down the pike uh, within months. So I think that's very exciting. Are these your friends? Well, I didn't, I've known them for about four years. Well, So, so they're um, my friends, but I, it's not like... On, I, I'm I'm in Denver. They're in San Francisco. On Skype, we can do the Hollywood Square thing. We we can do four. So if you <laughs> if you send them an email, I could Skype them both at the no, same I, time. No, I definitely think you should talk to uh, Roto, and especially Doctor Wu and Doctor So. I would be happy to also be on it. But we, there's there's a lot of other doctors involved, and, and, and dentists involved, and this is big. This is big. This is a big, going to be a big change, and I, I, I think it's going to be great for the general dentist. Do you know how disheartening this is? I did a two, uh, two tooth, crown and bridge or two tooth, cr two crowns restoration for number eight and nine on a gentleman on two implants about five years ago. He comes in about a year and a half ago, and he says, "You know, I've got an infection." So I said, why in the world do you have an infection? So I look in there, and sure enough, you got this huge periodontal abscess on one of the implants. So I flap it, and what do I see? Excess cement. You see cement. And the cement has caused a little food trap area, and, and he lost so much bone that the, 
it, it extended to the adjacent tooth so that the implant and the adjacent tooth had to be removed. S start thinking about that. You rhetorically said, well, how do you put on a crown? Um, you got a screw or cement. Is there another way? There used to be another technology. It was a Morse taper. Well, the Morse taper is, is still used, but it's not enough of a friction grip to retain only. You still have to have... Um, you still have to have... That, was, it, was that bike on at a Boston or something? Bike yes, on? yes, but still those those things um, are actually going down into the implant. You have to tap it into place because of this taper. It, it holds it by friction, but you, it's not retrievable. You can't, you know, once you're in there. Would, um, would these, um, would these excess cement, would it, would it be, have been less of a problem on that patient if they would have used a, um, like a, um, a reservable, a reservable cement? Or, or like, or something that showed up on actually, like Carl Mish talked about a zinc phosphate cement. Yes, yeah, and I and I had as opposed to a resin right. cement. And so I've some of my older cases when I've looked at them, I noticed the cement. I can see it there, and sometimes we've even gone in and flapped and removed that cement. Remember, not everybody that has excess cement is going to develop a perio lesion. Just the one, just the patients that you absolutely need it not to happen to. But would you say a zinc phosphate cement would be better because it I would, do, you I do? do, yeah, because it's visible. So you think because it's visible? Yes. I want to ask you another controversy. I want to go through the controversies. Some people make a religion out of drawing blood in their bone grafting and spinning platelets mm -hmm. and all mm -hmm. that, and then other people say that's just not necessary at all. What, how do you weigh in on that? And, and then I want you to follow up with the exact same thing on smokers on Dental Town. Half the dentists, if you check smoking, no. Other people say, I really don't have that big a problem with smokers. So we answer those two well, controversies. Of course, um, you're talking to a, a person who's very interested in tissue engineering. Matter of fact, I had uh, I was editor in chief of a tissue engineering journal for a while, and tissue engineering, in regards to the mouth, is generally creation of tissue bone or soft tissue or cementum or periodontal ligament. And so when we talk about um, healing of bone uh, using bone graft materials, if we start using biomimetic processes such as uh, platelet-derived growth factor or BMP, other kinds of uh, growth factors uh, like endogain, or uh, even the, uh, the different uh, allogeneic materials, they might have a, some BMP activity or some, some growth factor activity within them. So the, the idea of using uh, tissue engineering principles to try and grow bone is a good one. It, it has a very good basis, in fact. The best thing to grow bone is BMP. We know that that, that forms bone. And, but it's expensive, and a lot of people are not experienced with it. So what could we use that might be accessible, less expensive, and still give a little bit of a bump you know, for, for forming bone? And that's where the platelet to grive, you know, or the, you know, the PRP and these other spin down products that they, where they take blood and, and spin down the platelets and other factors that are there that are there even within that um, spin down there are circulating uh, stem cells so within our body about three percent of the nucleated cells are what we call smooth stem cells so they're circulating stem cells so that when there's an injury these guys congregate right there and then they do their repair they're ready to go so it's not just strictly local phenomenon where stem cells are attracted you get this circulatory phenomenon so if you can spin down some uh, concentrate and get these cells get some platelets get some other you know positive growth factors that are there you could increase the uh, healing capacity of a graft or, or of a wound so 
this was studied most extensively with PRP, which I used uh, about 15 years ago and stopped using. And the reason I stopped using it was because in the literature, it was studied many, many ways, we found that there was maybe a 10 or 15% increase in activity, improvement of, of the healing activity. And the, like platelet-derived growth factor, it also does increase the bone forming and the, and the wound healing capacity as well. But the the real pow, the real uh, muscle is is in the in the biomimetic uh, BMP too. So because of that, I switched about maybe almost 15 years ago to that, and went away from the less powerful. So. You know, BMP is the 100 mile an hour pitcher, and the others are the 50 mile an hour pitchers. So if I want to get a strike, you know, I'm going to I'm going to use that more powerful mechanism. So BMP, bone morphogenic protein, right? Mm -hmm. And where are you getting that? What are you? Using? Well, that's uh, there's only one company so far. There's some companies in Europe that are going to be coming on board too that are going to sell that product, and it'll be nice because it will have some competition. But BMP two is made by Medtronic in Memphis, Tennessee. Medtronic. Medtronic. Yeah. I thought Medtronic was out of uh, Minnesota. I thought they were in no, Rochester, no, Minnesota. No, they're, they're in Memphis, Tennessee. Medtronic's headquarters are in, mm -hmm. in Memphis, Tennessee, mm -hmm. with uh, FedEx. Mm -hmm. And uh, and what percent of your implants do you use BMP? Just just only when you bone graft? Well, <clears throat> let's just rather say what percentage of my bone grafts do I do? Uh, you know, use BMP. And maybe that could be 20% uh, or so. 20% of your bone grafts? Mm -hmm. So a lot of the bone grafts I do are very small. We use allogeneic bone or, or xenograft, you know, and maybe we're just, you know, kind of patching a little hole or something. It's not really indicated to do a big, you know, graft with BMP in those settings. So most of the grafts that we do are like a socket graft. Take a 2,000, maybe socket grafting. There's no need to do BMP in that setting, for example. What did you think of, um, what did you think of uh, Megagen when they came out with it? Take the extracted tooth and put it in this pulverizer and use that for your bone graft. Have you seen that? I th yeah, I have seen that. I think that's okay. You think yeah. that's okay? Yeah, I think it's okay. That would be a very low-cost source of mm -hmm. bone grafting. Mm -hmm. Are you using it yourself? No, I'm not. Um, and why? I am a little bit on the controversial side on bone grafting is that I don't socket bone graft very, very much, just in the anterior maxilla. So I think uh, in most periodontist offices and maybe most general dental offices, uh, they take a tooth out and they graft a socket. I don't do that. <laughs> why, why do you not do that? Because uh, the socket is the best healing um, place for making bone in the in the human body so there when you take out a tooth the pdl has stem cells that are in the in, left in the socket and they immediately start forming bone and the majority of extraction sites as long as there's not a dehiscence facially will heal just fine there'll be a little narrowing of the site but you can avoid having you know the complication of an infected graft or giving that extra cost or treatment to a patient uh, by just letting it heal. So, so, so I do not graft molars, bicuspids, canines, anything in the mandible. So I basically only graft the anterior maxilla. For maxillary incisors. Mm -hmm. yeah. And is that just General. in high aesthetic needs? Like yeah. Women with high lip lines, mm -hmm. not a short, fat, bald mm -hmm. guy like mm -hmm. me, you wouldn't do it? No, I'd probably do it for you, too. Hmm. And then, and then um, true or false, it seems uh, we, we know 19% of Americans smoke. Uh, at the end of World War II, it was half. But it seems like a lot of these people that need implants or, or dentures or things like that, a lot of them, you know, smoked. Um, what, what, so what, how do you, you know, how uh, are we supposed to evaluate this a This sounds kind of cavalier. I almost ignore it. So if they're, if they're smoking, I, I still go forward with the treatment. We still have success with these patients. We warn them that they have a higher incidence of, you know, failure and so on. 
uh, but we generally kind of ignore it. Now, I will tell you, if you can stop 15 days before surgery, the nicotine is not in the body, because it takes about 15 days to clear that out, then you're going to have less vasoconstriction, which is, leads to healthy healing, right? So if you're trying to do a fancy bone graft and a smoking patient, that's going to add risk to your case. So what I tend to do in smokers, I don't tend to try and treat my plan too fancy a stuff. So an all on four is a good treatment for them because there's no bone grafting, for example. But if I have to do a sinus graft, I do think that that's uh, an area where you're adding a lot of more risk for, for the patient if they're going to continue smoking. They say you never talk about uh, religion, sex, or politics, so let's go right to politics. Mm -hmm. um, you're a fellow of the American Academy of Dental Anesthesiology. They have been wanting their own specialty for years. Mm -hmm. They've never been given it. We just saw last week the Texas Dental Society, a branch, the tripartite branch of the American Dental Association, took these guys calling themselves implantologists to court saying, you cannot call yourself an implantologist because that is not one of the nine specialties recognized by the ADA. And basically the court said, dude, the ADA is not a government agency. You're, you're a club and you can kick them out of your club, but you, you have no legislative yeah, no, authority. Yeah. Am I paraphrasing this right? And what are your thoughts? Well, on Well, you know, I, when, when I started doing anesth anesthesia, uh, for anything that I wanted to do, the anesthesiologist, the, the physician anesthesiologist, didn't like it. For for example, I was just recently doing some stuff in China, and I was talking to the surgeons there who are trained just like me. They are not allowed to do anesthesia in their private office. So if they want to do some wisdom teeth under anesthesia, they have to go to a hospital and a separate person, an anesthesiologist, has to do the anesthesia because they, in their governmental, their legal system in China, the, the operator that's doing the surgery cannot also do the anesthesia. So that's, that's a big extreme, and, and England it has, has a similar type of thing. So here we are in the United States, you know, kind of the cowboy country, we figured out, okay, well, you know, the oral surgeons, if they have a lot of training, uh, they can do the anesthetic and, and, and safely do the, the surgery both at the same time. And we have done that for years and years and years. And now, occasionally, that gets challenged for the sur oral surgeons. And most recently in Colorado, that was challenged two years ago when we had our sunset review. So we... We, as oral surgeons, had to go fight against the anesthesiologists to maintain our situation. Now, that's just kind of background to, okay, now we've got another group who haven't done residency and general anesthesia and spinals and all the other stuff. Basically, general dentists, most, most of them. And... Um, they want to form a specialty to kind of go around not just the oral surgeons but the the medical anesthesiology guy. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And so we are even getting a little bit more uh, uh, far afield. You know, if there's there's a death, and there are deaths, oral surgeons have them. You know, we we feel terrible about it. We remember it for years. We we had one in Colorado. We get, we go to a meeting. We all we all remember that. We talk about that. We worry about that. And to open things up more is going to add risk to the public. Now, should we do it? Will we do it? Is it inevitable? Could there be training programs that would make equivalency? I think there probably could be. And I think it probably is ine inevitable. But take care. Because what happens if we do have a lot of, um, you know, complications, deaths, and so on, we could end up like they have in England and China, where we end up with more restrictions than we, you know. 
Do you think dental anesthesiology with... should be a new specialty at the American Dental Association? I, I don't right now, but I, I'm open to a discussion on it and to see what the training would be and to really see what would be best for the society and also for... for um, and why are you against it now? Well, because of safety and for... Um, you know, making sure that the delivery of care is optimal for the patients. So do you think this Texas court case will go to keep going? You think I do. It'll go to a federal, I think it'll progress. And, you think it'll go all the way to the Supreme I, Court? And I think that, uh, you know, I, I have a very good friend, um, General Dennis, that took the two-year residency program. I use him sometimes for anesthesia for myself. So that that's kind of hypocritical, isn't it? I, I trust him. I know he's very good. So just need some standardization, and then these things can possibly uh, be worked out, but it's maybe more training than people want. Like it could end up being three years of, of residency, and it's not going to be a weekend course. Well, the, here the University of Oregon has a dental anesthesiologist, yes. especially. So yeah. does Pittsburgh, don't they? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So do, you, they do you like these curriculums? I do. I do. How, how, many, how many of the... 56 dental schools have a... I don't... I think there might only be... You know... They they had one at Northwestern. That was a full year. So you're well, you're probably talking right now to mostly kids under 30. And a lot of them that don't place implants, like you just said, two-thirds of the general dentists don't. Um, um, is there... Do you think there's any really major difference between a periodontist placing an implant or an oral surgeon? <laughs> you know, I, uh, I used to be on the faculty at... University of Colorado. I'm not there now. I know I'm at the University of Utah, by the way. University of Utah Dental School? Uh -huh. Which one they have two now? Yeah, I'm at the university. Is yeah. that in South? Yeah, it's right in Salt Lake City. It's in Salt Lake City, and yeah. the other one's in South Jordan? Yes, right. Okay, anyway, so I'm an adjunct faculty there now. So anyway, I was uh, had an argument with, not an argument, but a discussion with Norm Stoller, who was the chairman of Perio at, at CU. And he said, Oli, who do you think should do implants, oral surgeons or periodontists? And it was a little tongue-in-cheek discussion. And I, and I made my case, and he says, okay, I'm going to tell you something. I went through 10 uh, categories or reasons uh, that would pit one profession, one specialty against the other. You want me to go through it with you? So he went through it. He says, who should do the implant when it's uh, supporting an eye prosthesis or a nasal prosthesis. And he, he, parenthetically, he said, well, the oral surgeon. Okay, so you get a point there. And he went through this whole thing, you know. And then the soft tissue around implants, he thought periodontists could do that better. So he got a point there on that side. Anyway, when it was all done, it came out to be six to five or something in this point span. In other words, both, both can do it very well. I was trained by periodontists. I train periodontists. Periodontists come in and do work with me. I work with periodontists. I refer to periodontists. They refer back to me. We should be working together and collaborate. They have a great knowledge base, excellent doctors, and then we have the same. And, and so I, th I, I don't see it that it's uh, that much different, really. You know, I always I always tell Dennis that, you know, you only live once. Be happy and healthy. If your passion wants you to go do something, just go do it. Worry about the business later. But I want to take the passion off the table. If, if a general dentist didn't have a passion to learn implants and say they were in a small town or whatever, um, what do you think of the people who say, well, I, I don't want to go learn how to place implants. I don't want to place 100 to reach critical mass. I, I don't want to do all that. I'm just going to have an oral surgeon come. I'm, I'm going to put all my implant cases on one Friday a month, have an oral surgeon come in or a periodontist load them up. What, what do you think of that business model? You know, um, I don't like it. The in, in Colorado, you have to have a separate DEA number for each office location you work in. You have to have also call backup. So let's say somebody did an anesthetic, they did a surgery, and then they left, drove off two hours to another city or something, 
and there was an anesthetic complication. Maybe the patient stopped breathing or maybe they had a, you know, whatever. I don't like the uh, itinerant um, in, in surgery where you're doing general anesthesia. I don't like that so much. So I'd rather see a situation where the dentist actually learns how to do some of that and then refers out to a local doctor. I think that's a better model for optimal treatment of patients. And in the end, it might actually even be economically better. I always, uh, I always think it's funny how a lot of dentists are led to believe that if you're going to be successful, you got to have lasers or place implants or have a CAD cam or this or that. But it seems like if I lined up a thousand dental offices, they're just totally general dentists, totally successful making bank. It's always just restorative dentistry. It's just right. fillings and crowns, right. but the market right. makes them believe they need to place implants, get a CBCT, get a mm -hmm. CAD cam, get a mm -hmm. laser, get all this fancy, crazy stuff. And I, I just don't see it in the real world. I, you know, the best dentists, the most successful dentists I've seen have been the ones that get involved in things like Panky Dental Institute, Seattle Study Club, Academy of General Dentistry, you know, or university, you know, we have, we've had them. And those, those kind of people that are really engaged, they tend to get more involved in the kind of the holistic care of the patient and not so much trying to do every dang thing. And so if you know how to do endodontics, great. But if you don't, just think about the whole patient. You're going to be very, very busy. Send that endo out to your friend and you're still going to, you know, be very, very successful, I think. And I see, um, I see that, um, also a, a different phenomena. I, I don't see that, um, panky or this or that helps them i see that they go to the quay center and john quay is is now their vince lombardi they go to uh scottsdale center and frank spear is their vince lombardi peter dawson i mean he's he's motivated so um bill dickerson and vegas i i, I see that these institutes they fall in love with a, a charismatic vince lombardi guy they do <laughs> that makes them be more than they could have been right so those institutes are priceless if you fall in love with some leader that makes you play harder, dive for the ball. Hey, you, you talk about a term that uh, I bet you 99% of the listeners never heard of. What is distraction osteogenesis? Uh, in the year about 2000, maybe 2001, I wrote a book called Distraction Osteogenesis of the Alveolus, and it sold out and worldwide. And it was big. And then about three years after that, I, I hardly ever do that operation again. Because we found something that works as short, well. Short life. Yeah, span. and so distraction osteogenesis is a, was invented by, a guy, by an orthopedic guy named Elizarov, a, a Russian guy, who actually treated Valerie Bromel. Do you know who, remember who he was, the high jumper? He was the world record. He jumped seven foot five. That was not one of my sports high jumping. Anyway. I did not have the body for gravity. Bromel got in, an, in a motorcycle accident and lost three inches of one of his legs. Length. So it's shortened. So Lizaroff cut the bone, put a, a spreader on it. I remember this. And grew the bone in Valerie Bromel so he had equal length legs and could return to high jumping. He never did as well but imagine that that's distraction osteogenesis distract the bone so it grows within itself and we did that in the jaws but i've we found a replacement they're doing that. that to increase height height yeah height and width height and width yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so short people can go get there and they'll mm -hmm. make cuts on their legs mm -hmm. and then you could do a you could get longer arms you get longer legs you get longer jaws so, for example, I've used it in the maxilla, uh, the upper jaw is way back. I cut the jaw and slowly move it forward. That's by distraction to get the, the jaws to line up. So I've used it for that. So are there any other, uh, any other things you want to talk about? Uh, any, any other things you think are uh, what's no. hot? 
No, I'm just very happy to be in the profession. I'm glad that I can continue to be active. I want to make a contribute contribution to uh, patient care. Now I'm I'm teaching and doing some philanthropy, you know, philanthropy in um, in Israel and at Utah, trying to get. Like, for example, I'm trying to get Israeli students to come to the university here and then send some of our you know, students over there. I just think collaboration is the way that we can help the world now. And I'll, I'll end on um, the remote control. Everybody has a television or remote control. And in my office, our motto, our mission statement is just treat the patient like you want to be treated. And the reason nobody can figure out their remote control is because these uh, cable television are monopolies. And when they go to build a remote control, every department has to get their five buttons in, their ten buttons in, the DVD people, the movie select. And I've never met anyone who can figure out their remote control. And dentistry needs to not be the remote control. They need to just, if, if, we, if we ask every question, what is best for the patient? And work back from there. A remote control would probably, the very best ones, if, if Apple made it, it, it couldn't have t 10 buttons. It'd probably have six buttons, may, maybe four buttons. But the one from Cox and CenturyLink has 50 because they're focused on themselves. And, you know, if you just keep it focused on the patient. But, Ole, I can't believe I got a legend like you to come all the way to my house on a Friday. And it was I appreciate just, it very much. It was just a huge honor. And, and the takeaway is he just, he just said, go to, go to Clear Choice. If, if you want to watch an implant, if you want to learn, and you'll make an oral surgeon friend, you'll make a prosthodontist friend. Can they use your lab too? Yeah, they, can use lab. they can use the lab. You don't have to pay $5,000 and fly 1,000 miles and stay in a hotel. Uh, to watch someone place an implant. So I hope you guys had half as much fun as I did today. Thank you very much, Oli.